This is a 1994 TVR Chimera, and it's very bizarre. It's a British sports car with a V8 engine and a lot of weird and interesting quirks. These weren't sold here in North America, and this is probably one of the only ones here in the United States. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, big news, this TVR Chimera is currently for sale, being auctioned live on Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website. This is a V8-powered high-compression model, and you'll probably never find another one like it in the United States. So, once you've finished watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this TVR, where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. So let's talk Chimera. If you don't know TVR, it was a slightly insane British sports car company that existed from the 1950s to the 2000s, and they made some iconic and very exciting sports cars. The Chimera was TVR's most popular model throughout the 1990s, and it had V8 power, rear-wheel drive, a manual transmission, and small sizing and light weight. The Chimera was never sold here in the United States. No modern TVR models were, but it's here now, and today I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the Chimera and show you all of its interesting quirks and features, then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of this very quirky vehicle with getting inside where there's actually a quirk unique to this particular Chimera, and that would be the key situation. This is the key. It's just a fairly normal looking key, nothing unusual there, but it comes with this key fob, which is a Volkswagen Audi key fob. I asked the owner, what's the deal? And he said, someone programmed that to make it work as a fob. So you can press unlock on this fob and it actually unlocks the doors. You press lock and it actually locks the doors. Obviously, this car didn't come with this from the factory, but someone has added it later. And this is a switchblade key where you press the button and the key pops out, but that part was left blank because this car already has an actual physical key. They only needed this fob for the locking and unlocking. I think it's amazing that this car has that as an aftermarket from a Volkswagen key fob. But anyway, once you've unlocked the car with that rather unusual key fob situation, the next challenge is getting in. You can see there's no immediate obvious door handle on the outside of this door, and that's because the door handle is here, this exterior lock. You push on that, and then the door pops open, and you can open it the rest of the way and climb inside. Now, later TVR models switch to a door opener button on the bottom of the exterior mirrors, which is even more insane, but this car has a slightly more traditional button next to the doors. You press it, and the doors open up. But that's not to say that this car doesn't have an enormous amount of door-related quirks because it certainly does. One of them is this frame for a quarter window that doesn't exist. Some cars have a little window here, but this one doesn't, and yet it still has the frame. But when you roll up the normal windows in these doors, you can see the windows cover up this frame, making it look like there's a quarter window there, but there isn't. I have no idea why that frame is in place. And actually, it's kind of dangerous because if you open up the door and go to get in the car, if you bend a certain way, you might catch your face on that frame, and it is quite sharp, and it sticks up and pokes you if you don't look out for it. A very strange piece of design, and things get even stranger once you get to the inside of the door panel. For instance, there you can see a cigarette lighter. Not in the center console like so many other cars. The driver has a personal cigarette lighter in the driver's door panel of the car. It's a very strange placement. And the driver also has a personal ashtray here. This little panel pushes out, and an ashtray unfurls itself, so you can use that, your personal cigarette lighter and ashtray, while you drive down the street in your TVR. Also unusual in this door panel is the power mirror control. You can see 
there's a little joystick here to control the power mirrors, but how do you decide which mirror you're controlling? Well, there is a hidden switch inside the door pocket you can see here, and as you press that, it changes which mirror you're adjusting with the power mirror control, but it still gets stranger. That's because if you look on this door panel, you can see there's no interior door handle. There's no latch you pull in order to get out of this car. So how do you open the door from the inside? Ha! <laughs> that would be this silver circle in the center console. You can see it here, and it has some arrows on the top that point in the direction that you can turn this silver circle. You turn it to the right, and the right side door opens. You turn it to the left, and the left side door opens, and that is how you open the doors in this car. No traditional door latch. That would be so easy and obvious. Instead, this weird circle ball in the center console is what opens your doors. And the strange only continues from here. In this interior, you have only two climate vents for the occupants of the car. One over on the passenger side, incredibly tiny, and one over on the driver's side, incredibly tiny. There are no center climate vents in this vehicle like there are in basically every other car. Not that it really matters, because the climate controls also leave something to be desired. To control the climate in this car, you have these two dials here that move from left to right. The upper one controls the upper climate control air temperature. That would be the temperature on the windshield. The lower one controls the temperature in those two vents I just showed you on the dashboard. You move left to right for cold and hot, and that's how you change the temperature. Your only other climate control in this car is this little dial here that says zero and then has lines of increasing size. That controls your fan speed. That's it. You don't have a button for a window defogger. You don't have a button to control where the air is coming out, lower or upper. You only have fan speed and temperature, and that's all you get for your climate controls in this car. Kind of an afterthought. And then there's the insanity of the turn signals. The lever to control the turn signals is a little stalk coming off the steering column. This is pretty common on right-hand drive cars being on the opposite side of what we're used to in left-hand drive cars. That part is not weird. The weird part is that when you turn on the turn signals, the interior indicator blinks on the passenger side of the center console, basically as far as possible away from the driver. So there's no indication in the gauge cluster that you've left on your turn signal. And, of course, the turn signals in this car or don't cancel. So when you make a turn and go back straight, they stay on. And you don't have a great reminder that they're on unless you look over to the passenger side of the center console for some bizarre reason. Now, mounted next to the turn signals, you can see a bright red unlabeled circle button. That is your hazard lights. You press that, your hazard lights go on. A label would have been nice, but it's easy enough to deduce what that is. It is less easy to figure out the rest of the unlabeled buttons in this interior, specifically these three black circles in the middle. Just have three, they have no explanation of what they do. So I played with them, and here's what I discovered. The black circle over on the right turns on your parking lights. You press that, and then you can see a little parking light symbol illuminates right below it, and then your parking lights are on. Pretty simple. The black circle over on the left illuminates your rear fog light. You press that, and you can see a little rear fog light indicator appears below that button, which is pretty simple. But, interestingly enough, the button in the center Center controls your regular full headlights. Again, this is unlabeled, but this is how you turn on the headlights, this center black circle button. Now, when you press that, the indicator below that button does not turn on, because that indicator is for the high beams. <laughs> which are activated by the turn signal switch, like in a normal car. You push it out, and then your high beams are on. But what that means is that there is no indicator light that turns on at all when you turn on the normal headlights. You do get an indicator for your parking lights and for your rear fog light, but the headlights themselves do not let you know when they're on. You just have to know because you pressed an unlabeled black circle in the center control stack. And since we're on the subject of rather insane controls in this car, how about the window switches, which are nowhere to be found? They are not on the door panels, as you saw earlier. They are not obviously in the center console. You look around for them, and finally you discover them mounted in front of the gear lever, sort of on the back side of this panel, where you cannot see them when you're sitting in the car. You have to kind of feel around for them or just know that they're there, and that's where your window switches are. And things still get more bizarre in this car. Over on the passenger side of this interior, you do 
do not have a cigarette lighter like you do in the driver's door. There's no cigarette lighter in the passenger door, and there's no cigarette lighter in the center console. So even though the driver has their own personal cigarette lighter, the passenger doesn't have access to any cigarette lighter. And if they wanted their cigarette lighted, they would have to ask the driver to do it for them, which seems like bad ergonomics. And speaking of that, practicality is a little bit of an issue in this interior. You have no center console storage area. Nothing in here opens. Even though you have a massive center console, it doesn't have any storage. And you don't have a glove box, although you do have this little leather pouch where a glove box should be, where I guess you can keep smaller items, paperwork, that sort of thing. Now, it's worth noting that you do have a rather large storage area behind the seats. You can see it here. It's carpeted. It has enough space where you can put a lot of stuff. But the weird thing about that is that the roof doesn't go into that space. And I say that's weird because when you look in the rear view mirror, most of what you see is the roof. Because it sits in this resting position so high up, you don't have any rear visibility when you're sitting in this car. They should have used this large storage space behind the seats for the roof to go into, but for some reason they didn't. So you do get extra practicality in terms of storage, but you lose the ability to see out of the car as a result, which is an interesting trade-off that I'm not sure I would have made. But anyway, since I'm mentioning the roof, let's talk about the roof because it too is very quirky, specifically the fact that there are three different positions that the roof can be in. Now, one is this, which is like the full convertible position. Open air, the roof is folded down, and everything is nice and convertible-y. But there are two other options. Most convertibles only have one, the top up. But in this car, you can put up just the rear section of the roof, as you can see here, and then you have like a targa. So in this case, you still have an open roof, but now you have a rear window, which allows you to see a little bit better. And you have sort of a targa look, which is kind of cool. Of course, your third top option is to put on a panel that comes with this car in the targa top area, and then you have a fully enclosed vehicle. You can see you kind of stick the panel in in the front, and then it sits on the rear targa top that's already in place, and then your top is completely on for those days where it starts to get rainy or wet. Now you have a full roof. But in case you want to go to any of the other top configurations, it is easy to do. You can remove that targa panel very easily, like I'm showing you, and then you can just store it in the trunk so you can have it with you while you're driving along in case a rainstorm happens to appear out of nowhere. As for the rear panel, this one is even easier. It has these support bars keeping it in place, but if you want it down, just sort of bend the support bars and then it goes back down very easy and then you're back in full convertible mode. So three different top options in this car. But anyway, next up, since I've already touched on the trunk in terms of storing the Targa roof panel back here, let's talk about the trunk because of course it has many of its own interesting quirks and features. Starting on the outside where you have this badge on the back that says Chimera in like the cheapest, crappiest looking font they could have found. It looks like they just found some supplier who would give them the word Chimera in a generic oval. And it looks awful and kind of reeks of an automaker who can't afford real badging, which frankly was probably true of this car. But anyway, next let's talk about the trunk and let's start with getting into the trunk, which is very, very bizarre. There is no keyhole or trunk latch back here. You can't just insert a key, twist it, and the trunk opens. It's not that simple. In fact, it's far from that simple. To open up the trunk, you first have to open up the driver's side door to the car, and then you have this little button under the steering wheel that you push to pop the trunk open, but it's not that simple either, because that button is electronically activated, meaning it won't turn on unless the car is on, or at least the car accessories. So when you want to get into the trunk, you can't just walk up and pop it open. You've got to open the driver's door, turn the key to accessories, then reach under the steering wheel, press the trunk button, and the trunk opens right up. It's quite a ridiculous process. Now, none of this would really be a problem if the trunk was very tiny and you didn't plan to use it anyway, but that's the funny thing about this car. The trunk is huge. You can see the cargo space back here is really, really massive. The trunk is big. It can probably fit a golf bag or two golf bags maybe back here. It really is a large, spacious trunk. The problem is not trunk size, like it is in so many sports cars. It's trunk access. 
leave it to TVR. Now, the other thing you can find under this trunk is the fuel filler door. You can see it here. This little cap is where you insert fuel. Now, in a lot of cars that keep the fuel filler here, there's a little hole stamped into the trunk so you can unscrew the cap and put fuel in without opening up the trunk. But of course, that is not the case in this car. To access this fuel filler cap, you have to first open the trunk and only then can you fill it with fuel, meaning that yes, every time you're at a fuel station trying to fill up your TVR, you have to have the trunk open, which is another lesson in bizarre impracticality. And if that wasn't enough weird stuff back here, I next call your attention to the brake lights, which you can see through here. It's kind of a strange thing how they're mounted. You have brake lights, turn signals, all that stuff, and the usual brake light casing, but then that is mounted within a separate, like, clear casing on top of it. So you have, like, a glass protector over the lenses, which are already there to protect the bulbs. <laughs> doesn't really make any sense, but not much with this car really does. And if you thought the trunk was weird, well, how about the hood? From the side, the hood looks normal, just like a standard relatively long hood like you got in sports cars from this era. But as you get closer, you'll notice the edges of the hood panel are turned up and there's actually holes here, obviously for heat dissipation, but I never knew this was a thing. I've seen pictures of TBR Chimera models for years and I never had any idea they had these little holes in the side of the hood, which is really a surprising thing to learn. I never knew that it was there. Now, opening the hood in this car is surprisingly normal, actually. It's the only thing in this entire vehicle that's normal. You have a little latch on the driver's side under the dashboard, like in so many other cars. You just pull that and it pops the hood, but then things get weird again. The hood is, of course, front hinged because in this weird car, it was always going to be front hinged. So you lift it up, as you can see, and then you have this hood which is a metal rod, fairly standard, but in order to get it to work, you have to kind of stick it into this little socket on the underside of the hood. It clips into place and then your hood is up. Now I mentioned that is weird because it's kind of annoying to pick up a metal prop rod to begin with when you're going under the hood because it gets really, really hot, but it's especially annoying to pick one up when it's hot and then try to fumble with it to get it to stick into a little slot. <laughs> it really would be a lot easier if you could just open it up and stick the prop in a little hole like so many other cars. But anyway, let's talk engine in the TVR Chimera. <laughs> This is a V8, and not just any V8. This is the famed Rover V8 that was made from the early 1960s all the way through the 2000s in various different forms and in many different vehicles. Now, all Chimeras used this Rover V8, but they had various different versions of it. Base models had four liter V8s. Top spec Chimera models had up to five liters, and there were a few different versions in between. This one has a four liter V8, but it has the optional high compression system for extra power. TVR says this car was making 275 horsepower. That figure may not seem like a lot, but this is a tremendously tiny car. It's only about 158 inches long, which is roughly the length of a Mini Cooper. So imagine a Mini with a 275 horsepower V8 and rear wheel drive. And it gets even better. This car weighs only 2,300 pounds. So it's tremendously lightweight, probably because they eliminated so many things. Things, but really light, really small, 275 horsepower is enough to get this car, TVR says, 0-60 to 60 in 4.7 seconds, which is still pretty quick and was very quick back in the early to mid-90s when this car was out. Now, one thing I really like in this engine bay is the VIN label, which you can see here, and specifically the etching of the VIN and the engine number and the body code into this VIN label. A lot of automakers still etch this, but it's done with a machine. Here, though, the letters and numbers aren't uniform, so you can tell someone hand etched the VIN into this little VIN plate, which makes sense. TVR was a low volume automaker. They were always kind of teetering on the brink of collapse, and so it makes sense they didn't have a machine to do this. There was just some guy in the factory who etched VINs onto VIN plates all day long, including this one. Kind of funny to see that. But anyway, next up, I want to talk through some interesting quirks in the front of this car, starting with the badge on the very front. The TVR badge. This is the only exterior badge on this entire car that says TVR aside from the wheel center cap. You don't have one on the back, the sides, just the front so you know what this car is. And if you're wondering how the TVR name came to be, the original founder of this company was a man named Trevor. And so he shortened Trevor to TVR and that stuck. <laughs> 
<laughs> TVR was the name then for 50 years until the company finally ceased operations in the 2000s. And finally, the last thing I want to cover here is the owner's manual, which I have here in which you can see the TVR owner's handbook. That's what it says on the front. You open it up, a few interesting quirks in here, but the quirkiest is unquestionably the very first page where you have in the foreword basically a long warning about the way that this car operates. It starts rather amusingly by saying that TVR assumes if you're buying this car, you've probably owned other high performance cars before. Basically saying, I don't think this is your first attempt at a high performance car because this is something you graduate to. But after that, it goes on for the rest of this forward to basically be a cautionary tale about driving this car. And these cars did have kind of a reputation for being a handful. There's no traction control, there's no stability control, there's no anti-lock braking. TVR wanted to keep these cars lightweight and simple, but they were ultimately rear-wheel drive V8 powered cars that could get a little squirrely if you didn't know what you were doing, as obviously evidenced by page one in the owner's manual, giving a long caution about how you need to be careful if you have one of these. And last, I do want to give a little overview of the Chimera, sort of a general overview for especially my North American viewers who have probably never seen one of these before, except maybe in pictures. Like I said earlier, this was TVR's most popular car throughout the 1990s. It was sold from like 91, 92, all the way to 2003. And TVR made about 5,600 Chimera models during that time. Now, this was basically the same car as the TVR Griffith, except that version was a little bit more raw. The Chimera was more of the luxury touring version. The Griffith was more the focused sports car, but they had a lot of the same basics, same overall size, same powertrain options, and same general demeanor, except the Griffith a little bit more focused. And so those are the quirks and features of the TVR Chimera. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Chimera. Uh, I want to give a quick little overview of what this car is. I think the best way to describe it is it's like a Viper mixed with a Miata. It has sort of the rawness of a Viper, big engine, in this case a V8, but no traction control, no stability control, and it has kind of a rep for getting loose and killing people. However, size-wise, it's more of a Miata. It has 158 inches long is Miata size. I mean, this is a really small car. So you have kind of a Viper Miata mix. I think that really is the best way to describe what this car is. Now, I have wanted to drive one of these for a long, long time, ever since playing the game Gran Turismo. And I told the owner of this car, when I was a kid, I would play Gran Turismo, like in the late 90s. And in 99, my family went on a trip to London. It was the only international trip we ever took. And there were TVRs driving around, and I had only ever seen them in Gran Turismo, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Now, I went back to London three years ago. There really aren't TVRs driving around anymore. They've kind of, they're kind of gone. Uh, the company didn't go out of business. It was purchased by like a Russian, and that was kind of dissolved, and either way, they're not making cars anymore. So this is a treat for me as someone who's always wanted to drive this. So how does it drive? Well, for one thing, it really does feel raw. Manual steering, no power steering at all. Power steering was an option in these cars, but it's not an option that many people got. That was kind of the point of it. It was supposed to feel raw and unencumbered. And this car certainly does feel uh, that. And I say that because it's not just the no power steering. I mean, it's, no, it's turn signals on, of course. It's not just the no power steering. This car just feels so basic. You have kind of a rumbliness to it, like an old school muscle car, a Mustang, something like that, you know, from, from that era, from the 80s, the 70s. It has sort of a muscle car vibe to it. And you rev up that engine, even though it's the same Rover V8 that was like in Range Rovers at the time. It, it's a performance car engine in this car. It has kind of a nice sounding exhaust. And also, I mean, just the car is lightweight and low and fast. And so it feels performancy. This car is just plain cool. Now, visibility is absolutely atrocious. You can see why. In fact, your camera angle is pretty good to be able to see. You're mounted a little lower than my rear view mirror, but not much. The mirror is like basically here, and it doesn't give you much of a better view. 
The owner told me you can't see anything with the roof down, and if you put the roof up, you can see 10% better because that rear window isn't exactly great for visibility either. It feels cool to drive. I feel cool sitting in it. I just love this car. I've always thought TDRs were really a cool thing. It was more of an American type car than it was a, a British one. It was a big V8. It wasn't built all that well. You know, it was intended to really kind of kick you in the teeth. The owner of this car told me he bought it. He actually bought it on cars and bids, and now he's selling it on cars and bids. After a little over a year, he's owned it. He told me he saw one when he was younger in the UK and he just wanted it. And he kind of forgot about it until years later he was browsing cars and bids and there it was. And these are getting legal now. So this one is a 94 model. US cars, they can be 25 years old to import them. And so this car is now legal to import to the United States. What a ridiculous vehicle this is. I love it though, it's so cool. I have no idea what servicing is like. I have no idea what part support is like, reliability. Obviously the powertrain has good part support because it was used in everything, Land Rovers, all sorts of different vehicles. But the rest of this car, I don't know. I wouldn't want to get in an accident and have to do with body work. But I would say, you know, if you can keep it reliable, kind of keep the miles off it, don't use it too much. It's a fun car. Your only real drawback is you're driving on the wrong side of the road, which I find to be annoying. Um, turn signals on again, I'll never remember that. Uh, I've never liked driving right-hand drive cars in left-hand drive countries and vice versa. I've done both, neither is fun. Uh, and that's the only drawback of this car. I'm not sure they ever made any left-hand drive TVRs. The car was never really intended to be exported in huge numbers. So there you go, that's your TVR driving experience. There's a review of the TVR Chimera, a car I've always wanted to check out and always wanted to drive and it's been a thrill to get behind the wheel of this one. Absolutely a bizarre driving experience and a truly bizarre and quirky and unusual car. And I always love to drive the weird stuff and this is the weird stuff. And so that's the TVR Chimera. This is a very interesting car. V8 power, lots of crazy quirks and something that pretty much nobody else has, at least here in North America. It was a real treat to spend the day checking out this car. I hope you enjoyed Enjoyed, and now it's time to give the Chimera a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 50 out of 100, placing the Chimera here against some similar cars from its era. The Viper is probably the closest comparison we have in the States, and the Chimera falls just a bit short. Not as attractive, not as exciting, but the TVR is still a thrilling car, and it earns a higher weekend score than a Ferrari 348, though the TVR doesn't offer much in the way of daily usability and practicality. 